Wheatfield with Crows was a revolutionary masterpiece. It's the painting which begins modern art. Yet within a few weeks, the man who had achieved it had killed himself. Now, why would he want to do that? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most credible voice in true crime. In this episode, I'm going to take you through a three-page forensic report on Vincent van Gogh. The report is dated June 24, 2013. It is authored by a Texas-based forensic pathologist, Vincent J. M. DeMaio. And once I've gone through the three-page report with you, I want to give you a little bit of homework to do. I would love to do it on this channel, but it would mean quoting extensively from something that's available on YouTube and it's on 60 Minutes. So instead of doing that, uh, you can simply just click on the link that in the description and watch the whole thing yourself. But it is very important that you do go and watch it yourself. The documentary is based on the book and the research by Pulitzer Prize winning authors Naife and Smith. And once the book came out, it led to the 60 Minutes documentary, which subsequently made world headlines. And the headline was quite shocking, but also quite simple. It was the question, kind of a rhetorical question, was Van Gogh murdered? And I just want to refer you back to what Simon Sharma said at the beginning of his episode in The Power of Art, where he says everything was going right for Vincent Van Gogh. He'd just been hailed by the critics. He just sold his first painting and then he just painted his, a, a, revol, a revolutionary masterpiece, Wheatfield with Crows. So everything was going right for once for Vincent Van Gogh. He was painting more than ever. So why would he want to commit suicide? And that sums up the whole conundrum very, very simply. But you might say, well, that's really just circumstantial evidence. Do you have any proof? Well, that's what we're going to deal with in this episode. Over the past couple of episodes, I've been trying to slowly educate you guys on the backstory, the history, the culture, the individuals involved. There's quite a complex tapestry involved. To some extent, it is very intricate, but in other ways, you can sort of just look at the tapestry and get a very quick sense of what you're looking at. So there's a, a simple side to what we're talking about, and then there's also the subtle subtle aspects and what I'm trying to do as a true crime rocket scientist is basically put those two together I'm trying to put the forensics together the medical aspects the characters involved into one cohesive narrative and it's up to you to decide whether you think that narrative beats the current narratives that are out there specifically in terms of a true crime interpretation of what we're talking about and so one of the ports of call that I've tried to address in the last couple of episodes is just trying to familiarize you with the contemporary versions we have of some of these characters. And you can't get more contemporary um, than the At Eternity's Gate version of Van Gogh. So I've introduced you to that and I've, and I've showed you how terrible that contemporary version actually is. If Lust for Life was bad, and it really was, At Eternity's Gate is better, but not a lot better. Then there's Gorgar, Verge to Voyage to Tahiti. It's also a fairly contemporary working of the story, but because of modern approaches to sex and the Me Too movement, they haven't really been able to do justice, which is, I guess, a weird way of putting it, but basically 
to authentically tell Gaga's story. It's kind of an X-rated story. She can't really do it. Then the other characters that I've introduced you to, like Albert Aurier, the art critic, who kind of comes to the fore around about this time, 130 years ago. So it's quite his appearance on the scene is quite important. I also want to introduce you to Theo van Gogh. You're going to get to know him through his letters uh, to Van Gogh, and we're going to obviously go through those letters as they come through. We've got fewer letters from Theo van Gogh than we have from Vincent van Gogh to his brother, but we still have quite a quite an accurate portrait of Van Gogh's younger brother. It's also important to look at his backstory and also his death, the circumstances surrounding his death, and also his interactions with his brother. And finally, the character we're going to deal with right at the end is Dr. Paul Gachet. And uh, he may be the most important character to deal with of all, besides Van Gogh himself. And now let's go on to the forensic report, as I say, authored by a San Antonio-based forensic pathologist called Vincent De Maio. The report's not very long, it's just three pages long, and we're going to quickly go through it step by step. So the first point made by Dr. De Maio, and is referencing articles by uh, Louis van Tilburg and Theo Meerdendorp, translated from Dutch and published in the Burlington Magazine in July 2013, and also information in the... Um, the book by Nifan Smith. Bear in mind the following. The information that is in this forensic report isn't based on De Meyer performing an autopsy or anything like that. It's simply De Meyer being provided with information and him providing an assessment based on that. An expert assessment by a forensic pathologist based on the information. Okay? So, these are the couple of points that De Meyer raises. First of all, that Van Gogh was right-handed. He points out that in the book by Nifan Smith, the, the first physician to treat Van Gogh was Dr. Mazury. Now, already this is quite an important thing to bear in mind. Van Gogh's just been shot and he will take 30 hours to die. And he has a physician. His physician is Dr. Gachet. It's his personal physician. And yet the first physician to see him is somebody else. And so it's not from Dr. Gachet. It's not from his personal physician, but from someone else that we get a wound described in the following way. It is described as just below the ribs, about the size of a large pea with a dark red margin and surrounded by a blue halo. The, the wound path, in other words, the, tra the trajectory of the bullet, was apparently downward. So we're getting an incredibly detailed description of the circumstances of Van Gogh's injury from this doctor, Dr. Mazury. From there we get kind of a second opinion, if you will. We get a different view on the topic. And it's from another source, I guess, which is the Burlington Magazine article. And in the footnotes on page 459, De Meyer references a wound that was examined on the spot. So now we don't have one doctor that is looking at all of this. We've got two. And that second doctor is Dr. Paul Gachet. Um, and this article also references the second doctor, which is the local doctor, Dr. Mazury which the article presumes, or the, um, it is presume, presumed that the other doctor is Dr. Mazury. And then um, it stated that based on their findings, which were prob probably written down but later lost, um, other authors described the wound in a book published in 1928. Right? So bear in mind that this book came out around about the same time as the Lust for Life book. And I would imagine it was in a different language, but, but in any event. In any event, this early description was that the wound being 
along the side of the left ribs a little before the axillary line. So this is giving a little bit more information just on one particular aspect, which is the trajectory. Okay. And so very quickly, very, very early on, on, on the first page, DeMaio already asserts that it's his opinion and based on medical probability, the wound wasn't self-inflicted. And then he's explicit to say, in other words, Van Gogh didn't shoot himself. Now, what is he talking about? First of all, he's saying it's not a conventional wound. He's saying the injury sort of going straight kind of down the body, down the inside of the body. And I'll show you a, a little graphic in a moment to, to show you why the trajectory is so unusual. He was just saying just the trajectory was very odd. And again, this was not covered in Lust for Life. You don't see him actually shooting himself because that wouldn't really make sense. It would sort of be him pointing the gun almost downward to his hips, um, away from his chin or away from his throat, and certainly not directed towards his heart or any of the major organs. And um, so, so that part is already odd, right? The other part is Van Gogh is right-handed. And we'll see what that what role that plays in the whole thing. If we return to De Maio's report, he provides a couple of reasons for his opinion. And the first is the location of the wound. He says, if you accept the description of Dr. Mazury, the wound was in the abdomen just below the ribs. Now, what you can do wherever you're sitting or standing or listening, take your hand, take your right hand, and put it under your ribs, under your rib cage, right? And that is around about, and this is on the left hand side of your body, that is around about the area of the abdomen where Van Gogh was shot, and also in a downward direction. Not inwards, not into the abdomen, but down, okay? De Meyer then reviewed 797 suicides using handguns, okay? And he said 1.3% of self-inflicted handgun wounds were in the abdomen. So, so almost none. De Meyer then says if you accept that the wound was on the left chest, as in the article by De Meyer, then he says... A suicidal gunshot wound of the chest with a handgun accounts for only about 12.7% of cases. He says in either event, the location of the entrance wound is very unlikely. You can go through the report yourself if you, if you like. I'll put a link to it in the description. But the bottom line with the next part of the uh, description is he provides a sketch of the anterior auxiliary line and the middle auxiliary line and basically what he's talking about here are um, sort of lines along the side of the body so when i said to you feel under your rib cage you now need to move to the side of the the, the, the rib cage sort of um, under the armpit it's sort of that, that whole side of your body and now you've got to try and imagine would van gogh have shot himself there with his left hand Right, And first of all, you would intuitively say, well, wow, that, that, that would be a very weird way to shoot yourself and, you know, with your left hand. But if you used your right hand, why on earth would you sort of turn your, you know, why would you put your, your gun sort of around that side of your body and shoot yourself that way down, you know, with your right hand? It's, it's just very odd. And you can already see why the authors came up with this weird sort of thing where there was a strange scuffle with someone. And, and that is how they're sort of trying to account for this, this wound, right? It's through, through a kind of a, almost like a random scuffle and a gun going off. Does that make sense? In any event, it's De Meyer's contention that whether you're talking about a left-handed person or right-handed person, both of them don't really work. But if anything, the right-handed one makes even less sense, and Van Gogh was right-handed, and that's where that comes from. Because of this intimate trajectory, so you'd have to have the gun very close to the skin or the side of the body in order to self-inflict a wound like that. He, he's saying that you would need, uh, you would have powder burns if it was self-inflicted, just because 
a person holding a gun like that would have to turn their arms in kind of a weird way, twisted way, and that would force the weapon to be closer and closer to the skin, if that makes sense. You can kind of do that experiment on your own just to see what that would or should feel like. And DeMaio kind of emphasizes that the gun would need to be just very, very close to the body or at most just a handful of inches away. And then he refers to another reason why the wound could not be self-inflicted. He talks about mention is made of a small wound with a red or brown margin and a purple ring around the wound. And he says the, purple, the purplish ring is said to be due to bullet impact. Now bear in mind this is a forensic expert. He knows all about bullet wounds. So he's using years of experience to kind of diagnose what is going on with this description. He doesn't have a photo to work with. There are sketches, but he's essentially going on a description here. And he refers to the wound as a subcutaneous bleeding from vessels cut by the bullet, which is usually seen in individuals who live a while. So the, the wounding that you're seeing here is from um, injury or bleeding or whatever subsequent to the actual wounding or the actual injury. And he's saying the presence of this red to brown margin doesn't really mean anything. He says the brown rim or, or dark red margin around the entrance is an abrasion ring seen around virtually all entrance wounds. It just indicates an entrance. And this brings us to the moment of truth in this forensic report. He says the most important aspect of the entrance is what is not there. The absence of evidence is the most important aspect. He says handgun cartridges at this time, 1890, were loaded with black powder. Smokeless powder had only recently been developed in 1884 and was used in only a few military rifles. So you're only going to kind of get smokeless gunpowder in, in rifles, not small caliber pistols. He also is explicit to say black powder is extremely dirty. On burning, 56% of its mass is solid residue. And so now the question is, where was this? He says close range wounds from black powder are extremely dirty. So you're going to have this powder even from kind of a long, longish range shot. And a good way to imagine it is just thinking about Pirates of the Caribbean or those kind of um, films. You know, there's kind of a big explosion of smoke whenever they shoot something off. It's not quite as bad as that, but it's certainly there's far more black smoke than there would have been in, in sort of modern um, weapons and so the um, the doctor goes on to say if he shot himself and Gogh would have held the muzzle of the revolver at most a few inches away most probably it would have been in contact with the body he says this is due to the location of the wound and what he's saying is there should have been soot all over Van Gogh he should have had it on his face his clothing there should have been powder tattooing. There should have been searing of the skin around the entrance. In other words, there should have been almost like a, a, a pattern of um, incendiary soot that would have scalded the skin, creating kind of like a flaring around the bullet wound. And um, he said it would have been grossly evident. You wouldn't have not noticed it. And he said none of this is described. He said the, the absence of this, the absence of this um, red, reddening of the skin, the inflammation, the, the burning essentially of the skin by this powder, he says indicates the muzzle had to have been more than a foot or two away and closer to two rather than one. So he's saying that the gun was more than likely further away than close by. Right? And as soon as you start saying, well, it's further than a foot away, it's now almost impossible to, for it to be self-inflicted. Bear in mind what we're talking about. He's saying the gun would need to be far away in order for these powder burns to not be present. right? But at the same time, the further it is away, the more impossible it is to be self-inflicted. Try and just using your, your hand right now, 
pretend that your hand is a gun and turn it on yourself and see how far you can move your arm away from yourself. It's probably not going to be possible for you to move it more than about a foot away. Um, right? Now, if you want to try and replicate the trajectory, that is when it gets very, very difficult. It's going to be almost impossible to move it um, even one foot away. And so he refers to statistics on range and suicidal gunshots. He says 96% are contact. And this is a very, very interesting part where the forensics come, come in, is, is it says almost in every single case when people commit suicide with gunshots, they, they literally touch their bodies with the end of the weapon. So the the orifice of the of the gun or the um, uh, you know whatever weapon is being used uh, when it's either a gun or a rifle or whatever it is tends to be to make contact with the mouth the throat the head or wh whatever it is the, by far the majority tend to do that it it would be counterintuitive for someone to try to commit suicide and hold the gun like a long a great distance away from them right. He said uh, there is 2.5% or so a, a minority show an intermediate or show evidence of powder tattooing but are not in contact. So almost all of the suicidal gunshot wounds, and this is modern gunshot wounds, actually show powder tattooing, right? Show gunshot residue. And in his letter, he provides a, um, a a figure, figure number two, just showing where the range is uh, six inches, shot on the left, and one using smokeless powder. And then DeMaio concludes saying, based on the medical description of the wound, in my opinion, all medical probability, Van Gogh did not shoot himself. I'm not going to take it further than that in this episode. Nifa and Smith provide context and research based around this particular evidence, and you can get that from them in the 60 Minutes documentary. What I'd like you to do when you listen to the 60 Minutes documentary is, armed with this particular information, take down a couple of notes, um, make, um, make notes of or observations or points or comments of anything that just stands out to you as you listening to the to their little sort of account of what's going on and if you've got any questions you can um, uh, ask me in the comments or um, we will certainly address them in the next episode which is dealing with the accidental death based on the knife and smith version for those who are following true crime rocket science on patreon this Sunday at 10 EST, Eastern Standard Time, 10 in the morning, there will be a True Crime Rocket Science Live. It will be my first live, and I'll be discussing a couple of things in that episode to do with Van Gogh and also to do with the Chris Watts case, but just basically addressing you guys and um, dealing with a couple of true crime questions and issues. One of the things we're going to be looking at also is the Chris Watts case and the ongoing controversy around the shadows on the driveway and were there accessories and whatnot. So look out for that on True Crime Rocket Science TCRS on the Patreon channel this Sunday at 10 and I will see you guys there.